Hello and welcome to my podcast, And She Was. I'm Julie Wilson Nimmo and I just love the chat more than life itself. I cannot get enough of it. This podcast series aims to give inspirational, eloquent and motivational women who live and work in Scotland a voice and a platform to share their enthralling human interest stories with us. I love Gabby, feisty women and I'm fascinated as how they got to where they are today. My guest on today's programme never ceases to amaze, inspire and actually make me practically pee myself laughing every time I'm in her company. I count myself very lucky to have singer and actor Lorraine McIntosh as my good friend. Lorraine and I met when working as actors in the play Men Should Weep. A strong bond was formed and it stood the test of time. Now, unless you've been living on another planet, you'll know all about Lorraine's success as the vocalist with the hugely successful global band Deacon Blue. But what people might not know is that Lorraine had arguably one of the most challenging and tough starts in life. Lorraine's life story is like something out of a movie, from harsh beginnings to the dizzy heights of success. I'd never really delved deep into Lorraine's childhood before, and in this podcast, that's one of the first things we covered. There's refreshing honesty here, laughs, and raw emotions. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it. This is And She Was with Lorraine McIntosh. Good morning, Lorraine. Good morning, Julie. So thank you first and foremost, and get the wee official bit out of the road for coming and doing our podcast. I sound a wee bit croaky, can you hear me? I sound like I've been smoking a wee bit. You have. Well, you were smoking next, so it's a wee bit off putting actually. It's a bit Bonnie Tyler, but I'm going to say it. I mean, we're so excited that you're here, right? I'm not just saying that, right? Because obviously you owe me a lot of money, but also as well... (laughs) Coming on this as my pal, but I'm a hell of a nervous, so I'm going to get it out. I think it's worse say it. because we are pals. I'm I'm never really nervous doing interviews, but I'm slightly nervous about this one because it is funny talking to your pal. The best thing I can say about Lorraine from being her friend is that she always makes me laugh from the off. You can't ever be with Lorraine and not oh. be carrying on our laughing and stuff. And there is obviously a really serious side to the both of us. <sighs> but the thing about our friendship is the fact that we always. I would say the word deck ourselves. That's an East Coast Bride word, isn't it? I think it's a Glasgow thing as well, isn't it? I think laughter is just, I mean, I think it's the most important thing ever. And I think if you, I I don't have any friends that I don't really find funny or who can't make me laugh because I think being able to laugh yeah. yourself, being able to laugh at the world, being able because let's face it, if you can't laugh, you're going to be doing a lot of crying these days. But uh, I think it, uh, that's why people bond. And I think a shared sense of humour is a really important thing. What we always have had in common is the fact that we're both mums and when we met in a rehearsal room, mm-hmm. we always were like coming in to the room and yeah. going, wait to tell you what happened this yeah. morning. And you realise to... that the youngsters were coming in and it's not their fault because that's what we were like when we were young. You only really had your own problems to think about. Yeah. Whereas we'd be coming in and going, oh my God, this happened last night and one of my kids has done this and one's not feeling well or one's upset about something. And you carried all that with you. And it's like it's a real bonding thing, I think, between mums that are trying to work Yes. And, you know, have a career and be a great mother. And it's really, really hard. So when you find another mother in that situation, you're kind of drawn to them, I think. And also that fits in nicely with the podcast. For me, Lorraine, you are a really inspiring woman. You do come into a room and obviously, you know, people just have an idea. They look at you and go, oh, she's got this and she's in a band and she's an actor and she does this and that and her life must be so glamorous and all the rest of it. Whereas I know the nitty gritty of that. Mm -hmm. I know the story behind that. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you're open and sharing it and the fact that Mm. we can have an absolute riot about it and then next minute we can be crying about something Mm -hmm. as well. But that's the thing that people don't get. I think people just go, Lorraine McIntosh, she's this most successful thing. And then you break it down and go, actually, she's had to graft and graft and Mm -hmm. graft. And and I think I called you lucky recently and I'm apologising for it now because you're not just lucky, you're, you're at... I'm going to say a badass of a woman. <laughs> well, I take that as a big compliment. But it is, you but, are. Well, you are. I, but I do think I'm lucky though. I mean, I, I think gratitude is a really, really important thing and I have loads and loads to be really grateful for. I mean, I work with 
singers, I work with actors, you know, I see them all around me all the time. And I realise, and, and I, honestly, I'm not, you know, saying, oh, poor me or, you know, give me compliments. I know there are better singers out there, there are better actors out there. And sometimes you just have something and then you get a lot of luck. And I really think being in Deacon Blue, there could have been loads of people took my place in Deacon Blue. I happened to be in the right place at the right time and I fitted in and, and, I, and, I, and I know I bring something to the band. I'm not saying I'm not important in the band and I know I bring something when I do an acting role or at least I hope I do. But you, you realise there's a huge element of luck, you know, in both our lives. Mm -hmm. You know, we could we could have a very different life, let's face it, and we've been blessed to have this. And I think the important thing is that you have had that luck and you know that. So when you meet other people that are struggling to do what they're doing, that it's kind of your responsibility to try and make that a wee bit easier for them or to at least understand the difficulties that everyone's life's not dead easy and it's not lucky I'm not saying my life's dead easy it's had its moments but um, I'm very grateful because I have been lucky I love people's stories mm -hmm. and I love the chat mm -hmm. so if you wouldn't mind indulging us for a wee minute for people who don't know to go back if you like say somebody's listening to this and they go I don't know that about mm -hmm. Lorraine would you mind telling us a bit about your childhood and where you, your family background? Um, I've kind of I have spoken about my childhood in in press and stuff like that. Usually because I kind of had a, a quite a troubled childhood. I had a happy first part of my childhood. Mum and dad. My mum was Irish. My dad was Scottish. Got married. We we didn't have any money. We lived in a single end in Bridgeton in Glasgow where I was born. And then when I was three, my dad got a job in Ayrshire working at a, a pit down there as an engineer. So we moved lock, stock and barrel down there when I was three. And in many ways, that was a brilliant move to get out of the east end of Glasgow. And, um, you know, we had, a, we had one room and it's demolished and all that now. But it wasn't a nice place to live. So we were given this house, this council house. I think it had four, if you count them all, four bedrooms. We don't have enough furniture to put in them. But we had fields outside. It was a kind of well-designed housing scheme. So there was brilliant places to play. There were farms round about. So for us, it was an absolute idyllic time, really. <sighs> But then, sadly, my mum got ill uh, when I was about eight, and then my mum died when I was 11. Oh, and that was, it was a terrible time. And my poor father, I mean, I, I, I hate the fact that sometimes I talk about my dad, and my dad did have a drink problem after my mum died. And I hate the fact that someone can be kind of defined as that, oh, your dad had a drink problem. My dad was a brilliant man, oh. and my dad was a really loving man and a really caring man and he just couldn't cope and when I look at now what he had to cope with after my mum died he worked in a factory which he walked to which was three miles away home three miles at the end of the shift to three children literally going what are we having for dinner oh, where's my goodness. school uniform can I get this can I get that a financially it was a real blow because my parents had both worked and now we were down to one wage so that was a huge blow and obviously most importantly emotionally completely on his own he had no family round about him you know men in those days there um, and still in some ways these days their friendships were formed in pubs so my dad's way of coping with it was just to go to the pub you know to kind of dull the pain so it didn't end well we had a really hard really hard few years and eventually we were evicted from our home when I was, um, I think it was 18, just turned 18. And I got a call at school to say, literally from a social worker saying, just to let you know, uh, your family's been evicted, so don't come home today. And, and I thought, wow, OK. So my friend took me in until I finished school, which was, you know, really good of her parents. And then I came to Glasgow. But the thing that, I mean, the only reason that I feel okay about talking about all that, because I hate the idea of self-pity, is about the worst crime you could commit. Yes. And I hate that idea. But I work with the Simon community and I work, uh, do a bit of work with ski off and stuff like that. And when I see that kids are still going through that in Scotland, I think that is really unacceptable. Because a huge part of that, that experience to me was shame. It was experiencing shame. 
and no one could know about it. You couldn't talk about it. You had to hide it. Like somehow you had done something wrong. My father hadn't done anything wrong either. My Mm. dad probably had depression. You know, who knows? In those days, nobody talked about it. So now I do feel if I'm asked about it, I would love to think that somebody out there might be going through what I was going through then and thinks you've got nothing to feel ashamed ashamed about or worried about. This whole podcast to me is about women who inspire other women, especially for me, is the aim of it. Mm-hmm. But Lorraine, I can't actually bear that bit of your life for Aww. you. And honestly, I'm getting... Aww. Because I know you're such an amazing mammy, and I have said this before, but because you feel like a sister to me, when, when I'm hearing you saying it like that just now, there you are, that's happening to you at that age. You go to that place and it's like a sort of new start and all of these things, mm-hmm. and then your poor mum gets ill. And I know. So can I just check, is it you and your brothers? Two brothers, yeah. So how even did you have time... With your dad, you'd be worried about your dad and worried about your brothers. I mean, Mm. did you get time to grieve? No, I don't think we did. In fact, quite recently, in fact, during lockdown, I think when lots of us had a time to think about our lives and Ricky, my husband, he's writing a book at the moment about his memories of childhood. And it got me started thinking about mine. And I thought, no, I didn't really get a chance to grieve. My brothers were a bit older. So quite quickly after my mum died, my eldest brother went off to university in the days when poor kids could still afford to go to university because they got a grant Mm -hmm. and their fees paid and all the rest of it. So that was brilliant way out for my eldest brother. My next brother, he had a serious girlfriend and he kind of drifted away and moved in with her family because it was a much better place to be and ended up getting married. But I was at home, so I ended up in a very intense way at home with my dad. And, you know, it was really hard and it was really lonely and it was scary. You know, we had no electricity. The things that kind of upset me about it are thinking that you went to school in those days and you were punished for being poor, really, (sighs) because you'd go to school and you wouldn't have a PE kit. You wouldn't have sand shoes. You wouldn't have a towel sometimes to bring, you know. And you think, how could it be that teachers wouldn't notice that and say, oh, that's a girl whose mum died last year. Oh, we should maybe be a wee bit interested in that. Nobody, nobody came Nobody to did anything or asked about it. And I hope that's different now. I think it is different now. And I was really encouraged recently when I that whole um, discussion about period poverty Mm -hmm. in Scotland. And I think that is brilliant. These things are what makes a huge difference to people's lives, you know, because I've been there, you know. I've been unable to afford to buy tampons or towels or whatever, and you can't ask anyone for help, and you don't go to school, you know. And it has such an impact on people's lives, whether you can't go to school because you don't have dinner money or you can't afford to go in because I don't have the PE kit today and they're doing PE and I'll, I'll get into trouble, or I don't, I, I've got my period and I don't have sanitary towels. These are things that hold people back, and it's so unjust and it's so unfair. And that is my kind of driving hope that Scotland will be a country. I mean, you know that I'm a person that believes in independence for Scotland. And the reason I believe in that is because I think we have to do better. And I think our chance of doing better, of putting these things to the fore as important and as a kind of country we want to be, that to me ties in because I don't see it happening being hooked to the Tory government at the moment in London. Lorraine, a lot of people say these things and believe these things. You've lived through that Mm. without being cheesy. The word survivor comes to mind. And and it is that, Lorraine, because the thing I hate the most about that story is the shame, Mm -hmm. feeling the shame. And I remember being at school and you wouldn't know what was going on with certain people. Mm -hmm. And and it is disgraceful. And, you know, you you almost want to hold people accountable and go, that can't never happen again. Absolutely. And in our minds as as mothers Mm -hmm. going, imagine, you you know, start a school with some poor kid. They should have been all over you helping. And you, and the fact that you're looking after your dad, mm-hmm. you're trying to get an education, and as you say, how can that still be going on in our country? How can that still be a oh, child's hungry or a, a child's missing absolutely. out? Absolutely. Or- People talk about child poverty all the time, but child poverty, I think it's a bit of a misleading term because children are poor because their parents are poor, mm-hmm. you know. And Scotland, I mean, we've, we've kind of jumped onto Scotland here, but to me, has so much potential. And that excites me. But look at our drug deaths. 
Why are we the highest rate of drug deaths in Europe? Because I think our crime rates, our prisons are full. All of these things come from poverty and inequality. And that is something that has to be tackled. And I think it starts at the very, very ground. It starts with our children. I actually think you'd be a really good politician. I've said this to you before, but no, honestly, Lorraine, I would actually she's so I'd well like read. To. And but you are because but you have that you're drawn from your background there. But when when you're talking about your your brothers there, and I, I don't know why I've not thought about this before, Lorraine, but you're there with your dad and your brothers. Mm. There you are at that young age. So when all of that was going on, was music always there? Was music from yeah. your dad's side or your mum's yeah. side? Or? I think there was actually from both. You know, we sang a lot in Ireland when we'd go home to my mum's family in Ireland, but my dad was the singer. My dad loved music and loved singing. So um, in the years when it was just me and dad at home, when he was out all the time, the times that we did have electricity, we had a stereo and we'd have a few albums and I would play them over and over again and I'd stand and outside our living room was a big dark field so I don't know if anybody do you know if you've got the big light on in your oh, house oh yes I you do. can see your reflection in the window and you look great by the way because all you can see is your teeth and your eyes that's all you need and you can't see anything and I used to stand with a candlestick singing into that um, into that empty window to that empty field because you looked great in it and so music honestly that was that was the whole night taking care of just singing and that was uh, it was a lifesaver oh. and uh, yeah but you know you're right I didn't get a chance to grieve because I was worried about my dad and also you just had to survive and but that just to work things like you know, shifts that finished at 11 o'clock at night. I remember being out, hanging out a washing at 11 o'clock at night with my dad coming home from work, you know, and I was probably 12 or something, and you're hanging out a washing, and there's a wee bit of you that's, there's a tiny bit of you that's enjoying being the woman of the house. You know, for a small period of time before things went really wrong, I would take the money and I'd go down to the, the shopping, you know, the street, and, and I'd buy the the mince and potatoes and the carrots and the onions. And I'd think, this is great fun, you know. I'm, I'm a grown-up here, but you weren't a grown-up. And you shouldn't have been really no. being asked to be a grown-up. But, um, yeah, it was, a, it, was a, it was a hard time. After your time there, you're mm-hmm. about 18, mm-hmm. is it right that then you came back to Glasgow? Mm-hmm. So I got told that we'd lost our house. So my friend, I was still at school, so my friend at the time... We were in Kilmarnock at school and we got to the bus station and our school bus came in and she sort of, there, there's the bus. And I, and I hadn't told anyone about this phone call and I said, well, I can't go. And she said, what do you mean? And I said, told her what had happened. And she said, hold on, I'm going to phone my mum. And she went to the phone box and phoned her mum and she said, my mum says you've just to come with me. So I got on the bus and went back to her house and uh, her mum was lovely and I only had about four weeks of school left to go or something. And her mum said, will you just stay here? With us, and but I had nothing. I had no clothes. I had nothing because they put everything out in the street when you're evicted. Is that as quick as that? That's quick it? as that. You know, I mean, my dad probably knew it was going to happen, and but the sad thing was we lost all my mum's things. So all my mum's clothes, all you know that that my mum had been dead what um, six or seven years by then, but we still had our things. But you lose everything, and they all went. They didn't they keep all went. Evictions are just a terrible, terrible thing to do to people, and to do to children and young people, and it still happens. It's a terrible thing. Anyway, I stayed with her for a few weeks, finished school because we were doing a musical at school because I wasn't working at school. That was a real loss to me because I was good at school and I loved school and I had been, you know, always really engaged with school. But then that just goes by the way. If you're hungry at school, if you're, you, you, you know, you're not turning up, some days you just couldn't even wake up in time because you, you didn't know what time of the day it was and no one was in the house, so you didn't go. I think I sat the exams but failed everything. In fact, by the time we got the results through, we had been, you know, evicted, so I didn't even find out what I got anyway, which oh. is probably a relief. But we were doing a musical called Free as Air. So that was, honestly, it was a lifeline because it was something to take your mind off the horrible stuff that was happening. But then when I finished school, my brother had graduated from uni and poor John was living in a rented flat and he said to me, you know, you need to come up and stay here. So I came up and he had a mattress for me and his 
bedroom in my poor brother. His love life probably took a serious hit with his wee sister sleeping in the room. And then Faith also became hugely important to me then. You know, he kind of, my brother had gone through this whole experience. We'd been brought up Catholics and from a long line of Catholics, but my brother had really encountered a real faith when he was at university and it kind of I think helped John deal with everything that was happening at home and he kind of spoke to me about it and that really became a really important thing to me and it was actually through a church that he said to me there are these young girls who are all in a flat and they need a flat mate would you be interested in it so I moved in with these girls and it was in the south side and that was the start of things really getting better so suddenly I was, you know, in a flat. I remember, and, and the, the amazing thing is in those days, I remember my brother saying to me, you can go along to the social security and told them my story and they said, oh yes, you're entitled to housing grant, you're entitled to benefit. Now, young people aged 16 to I think it's 21 aren't entitled to anything. Mm. How do they survive? That's why they end up in the street, you know. Mm-hmm. So my life became better and it was just a case of then working out, what do you want to do? You've got no qualifications. So I I started going to Langside College, resat my hires, got into um, Jordan Hill to do a B.Ed. in primary school teaching. So I really felt like I was taking control of my life and I was having fun. I was with people my age. And, and it was great. It, Suddenly, from a world of boys, uh-huh. you were in a flat with but how many girls? Three or oh, four? No, at one at that flat it was actually six of us, <gasps> and it was really quite intense. There was a lot. Of, I think there were all people like me who'd come from kind of hard places, you know. So there was quite a lot of neediness going on, but it was also great fun. But then I moved to the West End to Great Western Road, and that was really it was a brilliant wee flat. It was called it's called Bohemia. All oh. we did was carry on and like you and that's where I met you and Verno, and who you was the bass player in Deacon Blue. There he moved go. in as a flatmate and he, one of the funniest guys I've ever met. And we were just this kind of centre for all our friends all round about. We used to go to the Winters Girls pub across the road and then they'd all come back to our place. It was the hor- most horrible flat you've ever seen, <laughs> but. We were just really, really happy. And when you're setting that scene like that, I'm thinking about that this journey. So it's going on and up. At, at la- I mean, thank goodness it's going on. <laughs> yes. See that whole time, Lorraine. I'm imagining you. Is the music still there? It's always there when they're asking you what you want to do. Are you playing guitars? What are you doing? Well, you- honestly, I I've said this to people before. I never occurred to me that there was a possibility that you could make a life doing something you loved. I mean, I don't know about you in acting, but you were determined you were going to go to the conservatoire and that's what you wanted to do. Mm-hmm. I didn't even know the conservatoire was, existed, you know, when I came up here, or that you could be in a band. I just thought music was something you did at home. But my boyfriend at the time was a drummer and he'd moved up to Glasgow. He was in a band and they had two backing singers. And I used to go along and see them and think, oh, I wish I could was asked to do that. And then one of them left and they just said to me, would you be interested? I was like, yes. That's fantastic. So that was that was the start. And then I started singing in, in quite a few bands and making a wee bit of money. And I just thought, this is brilliant. And did you bask, Lorraine? Yes, we did. Yeah. Which was a brilliant way to make money. I bet. My boyfriend was a drummer and he was a great singer. My brother was a great singer and a great guitar player. So we used to go... Oh, honestly, it's hilarious when I think of it now. We used to get on the tube at George's Cross with a suitcase and in the suitcase was a snare drum for my boyfriend and we'd get off and we would busk outside Fraser's and we'd put the, the suitcase out for the money. Now, we used to make a fortune. Wow. It's not like nowadays where they had mics and all that. There was none of that. It you was just... Pierced back. It You sang really loudly. It was the worst thing in the world for our voices. Oh. But we sang all day and it was honestly, we couldn't believe, we used to make like £150. Now I'm talking when your benefit would be £30 a week. Oh. We'd make more busking, you know, it was incredible. Both guys were great singers and we all harmonised, so it was like three part harmonies and it was really, really good. We used to finish our busking five o'clock and honestly, you'd be frozen solid. Oh, no. We couldn't speak. You couldn't speak. Get back in the tube. We used to go to Winter's Girls with £150 and 20 piece. Oh. They used to take it all off us, give us the cash, then we'd get a curry and then just fall asleep by about half six. We were, it, it's exhausting.
I'm seeing all of this. You're setting it up, and I know that. I mean, the curry and counting the money and all that. Oh. That sounds like a brilliant life, but we know that it changes the gear. So, where yeah. at this point in your story does Deacon Blue come into your life? Well, Deacon Blue was kind of. In that point in Glasgow, in the mid-80s, Glasgow was a real hub for the music industry. All the a and people, that's artists in repertoire, who work in record companies, who kind of job it is to seek out new talent and then nurture them through the process, Glasgow became the place to be. So I was singing in bands and they were never really in the, in the middle of it all, kind of on the fringes, but would see these bands starting up and... And then the whole talk about was who's going to get signed, you know, to a record company. So I knew Ricky um, through my brother, really, through a big group of friends that lived in the South Side. And he was always in bands and we'd, we'd go and see him and they were called various things. But then they started this band and they were called Deacon Blue and went along to see them. Then I was asked with my, my friend to come in and sing in a demo and we went into this studio in the south side and I thought it was brilliant it was a real professional the best studio in Glasgow is that the first time you've been in a studio yeah, like that proper, oh, wow. a proper studio and it was just great and I remember we were in the live room and they were all in the kind of in the in the booth listening to us and they just wanted harmonies and I thought oh I can do that all day long yes. you know and and I think they really liked that because it's uh, just something I do but I love the whole experience and then I was asked to come and do a gig and it's kind of hard to remember how it all fell in place but I was asked to do a few gigs and uh, then I wasn't part of the band or anything like that though and then the word was they were getting a record deal by CBS Records and it was this massive six album deal and and I was so it was just mind blowing really that this had happened to people I knew and then they were going off to London to record Rain Town their first album and I had sung in a couple of the demos and I was still living in Bohemia in Great Western Road obviously no one had a phone in those days or a house phone or anything so I came back one day and I had a letter through the door from Jill Maxwell their tour manager saying uh, the band would like you to come to London and sing but we can't get hold of you can oh, you please, please phone this number Stop. and I was like oh my god have you seen this <gasps> right I, I, we, what, what are we going to do and I was you're, my pals were all saying oh you're going of course you're going and I said well it'd be the bus how am I going to get there and they were like no phone this number so I phoned and of course they were like no you're flying down oh, <laughs> I never oh, so I'd never been to London apart from passing through it one night on a bus so got to London, bought a yellow duffel coat in Miss Selfridge for, of the, did. for the experience that I need to look the part. A yellow duffel coat. Mm. <laughs> it's like a banana arriving. And they said to me, right, you come out and you from Heathrow and then you get the tube to Oxford Circus. And when you come out Oxford Circus, which is basically the busiest tube line in London, and Air Studios, where the Beatles recorded, oh. everyone is, you know, it's one of the most famous studios in the world. They said, right at the junction of Regent Street and um, Oxford Street, highest up high is Air Studios, right above, you know, Top Man and all that, that's where it was. So that, I just went in that day and there was this massive studio overlooking Oxford Circus. And I thought, what am I doing here? And the band were all there and they were all doing well, really loving it and loving this new friend f- freedom that having a record deal gave them. And I went in and they said, right, well, you know, you've got a few days, let's get started. And the first song I went in and sang was Rain Town. And they put Ricky beside me in a wee, wee screen between us because they wanted it to be live. And, and I remember thinking, this is a really important moment for me. I have to do this well. That was in the stars. I kind I mean, of was. was. When I was living through hard times and when I was younger, I never felt that that was my life. I always felt really optimistic. And I think that's youth. And that would be a terrible thing if young people now didn't think there's possibilities out there. You know, I was asked to go and do a, uh, give my prize giving speech in Kilmarnock in St. Joseph's probably eight, nine years ago now. And I remember thinking, oh, no, I can't do that. Prize-giving speeches are from people that have, you know, had PhDs and done this. And actually, it was my friend that was my priest at the school, um, the chaplain, he said to me, no, I think it would be great for kids to hear your story. And then, and Ricky said, because there'll be kids sitting there who are going through what you went through, who are excluded from prize-giving speeches that are all about 
oh, congratulations on your five A's or congratulations. So I went down and I did say congratulations if you're sitting out there with five A's. But if you're sitting out there with nothing, don't give up because I had nothing, you know, and loads of people have nothing. And it's not, this year seems like the most important in your life. It's not. There's a whole life out there. You've always been such a hopeful person and not in a, you know, you're very real as well, but to have that hope and even know when you're in that opportunity, when you're in that, uh, you know, recording studio in London and you were going in there and you were just enjoying mm. the opportunity. You were loving just singing yeah, by the absolutely. sounds of it. absolutely, that and was it. And enjoying their you know, rise to success, that must have been so exciting to be in with anybody who'd signed a record deal. And of course, everything else that comes from it is hard work and graft and luck, but at the same time, that's your voice that's took you there, mm-hmm. Lorraine, and to go, imagine you hadn't gone there. So do you mind, for for a wee minute, talking about the catastrophic success that Deacon Blue, for people that don't know, was that overnight or did that build? Well, Ringtown was sort of, um, I wasn't officially in the band. In fact, on the Ringtown album, it says all their names and then it says with Lorraine McIntosh. Does it really? Because I wasn't actually part of the band until after Rain Time was finished and then they were talking and it was actually Jim, our keyboard player, who said to Ricky, you know, you really need to ask her to join because at that point the, the A&R man was talking about me doing something on my own. Oh, okay. And uh, so Ricky and Jim came round to my flat and said, you know, we, we'd like you to join the band properly, which I was just delighted about because I was loving it. So the band kind of, we did work really hard that first year we literally had a wee van that we, the gear and we were in and we drove up and down the, the motorways to every town in England, to, you know, Oldham, Manchester, Leeds, Sheffield, London, Southampton. Touring that album, if you like. Touring all those songs, yeah. Okay. And we had done a wee bit before the album was recorded, but mainly after it. And Rain Town was not getting played on the radio. But CBS really believed in the band and really believed in the album. And they brought out this kind of deal which said if you buy Rain Town and you don't like it we'll give you your money back no way yeah oh. so they set out this big promotional thing and it started to get a wee bit more interest it got brilliant reviews and um, then we went back into the studio and we recorded Real Gone Kid which was going to be on the second album and then Real Gone Kid was a hit single and that basically changed everything and we hadn't expected that really because then suddenly you're on a list at radio stations you're on top of the pops, you're on Wogan, you're on all these, you know, all this stuff happens. And it happens when you're with a big record company. It happens all around Europe. Yes. So it happened, you know, you're in, you're you're getting up in the morning and you've been asked to do interviews and you think, I've done someone in, you know, Munich and someone in Washington and someone you know, with Japan and music just, when it goes out there, it just so goes it's like out you're there. sort of thrust when you're successful that when you watch films about bands and stuff like that and when you're describing it, I can see it in my head, it's like suddenly you're doing that in yeah. this single and it, it, it just blows it up. It really does. And it was, you know, everything just got multiplied a hundred times, you know. Suddenly you're, you've got a tour in front of you and it's a massive tour and you're touring Europe and you're playing... To, you know, you're playing Wembley Arena for four nights and you're thinking, you know, a, few, you know, a year ago we were playing to 30 people. And how did you take that step up to that? Because you're used to, you know, mm. playing and, and, and busking mm-hmm. and stuff. And inside, I mean, how do you deal with that? Did, was there a moment you stopped? Was it overwhelming for you or was it? I think, um, I think it was all really exciting and we really embraced, you know, Doing Top of the Pops, for example, to oh. me, you know, was just, you know, if you're out my generation, that was the thing that it, it, all you had to say to oh, then about, oh, yeah, I saw them in Top of the Pops. And when Ricky, Ricky was a teacher previously, and when he left teaching, he said to all his, you know, colleagues just to laugh and say to him, oh, because he was leaving because he had a publishing deal to go and write songs. And they'd say, oh, I will see you in Top of the Pops. You know, never and think they, they would. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, they did. And for my dad, who thought it was terrible because I also left college after a year because I was never going to be a primary school teacher, really. And my dad was mad until I was on top of the pops. And then that's it. That's what you should be doing, you know. That's like the actor's equivalent of getting in Taggart. <laughs> That's so nice you mentioned your dad because I did. I, I, I wasn't sure from when we've been yeah. talking before. Did your dad get to see the yes, success? Thankfully, for you? and oh, I'm really lovely. thankfully did. My dad got to see us. Really, we got to number one. Although my dad used to come out with the funniest lines, you know. My, my dad, our song "Loaded," 
my dad thought loaded was just about having loads of money, which it's not. <laughs> and he used to go about, just relax, because you're loaded. <laughs> and he thought that was brilliant, you know, just relax, because you're loaded. And my dad got to see us play the... Ed- In fact, that was the last night I ever saw him was the night we first... We play- not the Hydro, it wasn't there then, the SECC. <sighs> and he came and... Uh, in fact, recently we were listening to an old answer machine tape from 1990. Oh, wow. 1989, that we kept because he's on it. After the gig, phoning from Central Station saying, oh, that gig last night. And he said it was the best night of my life. Oh, you've still got we've it? we still got it. We kept it. We do not, you know, do not scrub over this on it because, uh, yeah, my dad got to see a bit of that, but... I w- he, my dad died in January 1990, so he died a month later, uh, at 61, just had a massive heart attack. So he never got to see, more important things, like he never got to meet his grandchildren or anything like that, but he got to see that the band had done well, and I think that was a whole new lease of life for him. You know? I was going to say, that must have been so lovely for him, because, let's face it, we're, we're both parents, you'd be worried about them, and oh, yeah. especially when your kids go into the arts and things, and thinking, like, you oh. know, my dad would always be, what's your plan B, and all exactly. that kind of stuff. Exactly. For him to stand there yeah. at the SEC oh, was so and see you, away. and all your glory, and... Um, are you like your mum? Do you look, did you look like your mum? I do. I look like them both, actually. But yeah. I do look a bit like my mum, and I look I look like him too. And I think my dad, you know, for for working class people in Scotland, you know, growing up in the fifties and stuff, life was hard. And then his life had always been hard. And then suddenly there's your daughter in front of eight thousand people, you know, and her life's travelling and having like you know. A great time. I'm so happy for him that he yes. got to see that. Yeah, I, I totally. Mm-hmm. It must be such a big thing for for your dad. And do you mind me asking as well, along the thread, just when I'm thinking, were you and Ricky together by then? We were together, yes, by by then, before my dad died, we were. Yeah. So that, in so fact, we got married a few months later, which my dad never got to see. But my dad got to meet Ricky and, you know, my, Ricky loved my dad, thought he was brilliant. Because it was lovely being able to introduce someone to him without all the baggage that, you know, oh, I'm still going through a terrible time with him. But then I had my own life. Yes. And my dad was kind of trying to make his own life and, you know, not that successfully. But it was lo- he was a lovely man and he was great fun. Do you think now you think more about him even now as you as yeah. you're appearing to be? Yeah, older? I do. Yeah. And I think now, you know, I, th- I used to think I was so kind of um, clever about it, you know. Oh, my dad had a drink problem and my dad was a... And I think now, yeah, your dad did have a drink problem. But your dad was a widow. He probably suffered from mental health problems. As I say, you know, my dad was lonely. My dad had no support. You know, who is anyone to judge anyone? No. You know, he just... He did the best he could. And he was full of love, you know. And things don't work out in people's lives. You know, I visited... Prison a few times with um, with my friend who's a priest in Kilmarnock Prison, and we've gone down and we a Deacon Blue played a huge gig in Kilmarnock Prison, which was oh, brilliant. I didn't know that. Yeah, oh, but wow. we've also gone down and done a wee solo thing in the chapel for lifers, which was about one of the most moving things I've ever done in my life. And there's these young men, and they're always young men, in front of you. And uh, my brother was with us actually, and we ended up chatting to them. And where were they from? Loads of them were from the East End of Glasgow. So poverty in amongst all that is just such a huge driver and you think, you know, you can't judge anyone because these guys are in there. Who knows what their life's been like? Who knows when they got involved in the violence, in the gangs or whatever, what was going on in their life? So the idea that just build bigger prisons, you know, put more people in them, that's not the answer. See that phrase there, but for the grace of God, I just believe that so strongly. Yeah, you know? and that's really inspiring to have hope, which you've so got, but mm-hmm. also how dare people make assumptions about oh, people. It's so it's so really unnecessary. upsets me yeah. because you've been lucky enough. My kids have grown up in a world so far removed from the world I grew up in. You know, we try and do things that introduce them to the idea that, you are really, really privileged, you know, and we need to get out there and get involved with people that aren't privileged because if you don't get involved with them, the way it works in society, if you're middle class, if you're well off, you are not going to come into contact with these people apart from maybe bending down to give them some money in the street. Mm -hmm. And I just think until you meet people 
and meet them on the same level as them, you are not going to fully understand you are really lucky and you're really privileged. You know, so one of the things we did, and I have spoken about it before, is we asked a um, young asylum seeker to move in with us, which at the time I felt really strongly about. It was when I, it was when it maybe five years ago. And there was a lot of people at first appearing, basically washing up in the shores, you know, of, of Britain. It was appalling. And I remember just thinking, we have got a big house. We've got a spare bedroom. Put your money where your mouth is, you know. It's my Christian faith that makes me believe these things. And I just think, we've got a house full. We've got an empty room. There's someone out there who needs somewhere to stay. Let's try it. And I was nervous. I won't lie. It was it was. He was a young man, he was a lovely young man, but you don't know that at the time. He was 20 and he came and he stayed. And it was such a brilliant thing for my kids to realise this guy's only two years older than you. And look at you making your plans for university, school, travel. This guy can't make any plans. No. This guy's life is prescribed by where he was born. And I think that when we talk about immigrants and all the rest of it, so we're lucky enough to be born in a country that doesn't have that problem. They're unfortunate. They're born in a place that's in the middle of a war or a famine. What right have we got to say, no, you can't come here, you know? I just don't get it. And I remember you talking about that at the time, but Lorraine, your kids will never forget that experience. And your I house, hope not. not. That, no, that's not why you did it at all. No. But at the same time, they'll remember that and they'll tell their kids about I that, hope that so. you did and that. And I hope and they'll do it and I hope that their lives will... You know, and he's doing really well, isn't he? I remember he's doing, doing great. Yeah. And, the, and another family who didn't live with us, but we just kind of befriended, who was from Rwanda. And her story is just incredible. What she's been through, literally genocide and escaped with her three young children. She's now a maths teacher in Glasgow, you know, and she and they have their own house and, and they come round to ours for dinner. And I think they are the new Scotland. They are our future. What they bring and her husband, who she was separated from, from four year, for four years, is now back living with his family. He is a computer analyst. This is the new Scotland. How inspiring it's is that? Just that fantastic. in itself. It's just and your face, you can't see your beautiful face, but it's all lighting up when you're talking about that. That's oh. just the fact that all of that as Lorraine, it's all tied into your background and it's but beautiful also, to use it like that. Think, uh, okay, my background's sad in some ways that period. But look at their background and look yep. what they've achieved. Yes. If you think you've had it bad, go find someone else that's had it worse. Yes. And it will put your life in perspective. Another thing that I have to ask you about, as well as your um, amazing um, musical career, is, of course, how we met, which mm -hmm. was through mm -hmm. acting. I would have loved the idea of being an actor. But again, no idea. How, there was no drama clubs and I certainly couldn't afford to go to them if there was. or There was nothing like that in come that where I grew up. But then when I came to Glasgow and I was kind of working in bars and doing various things, I literally passed the RSMD in oh, Cannon yeah. Street one day with my boyfriend. And they, I said, that's an acting school. And I remember we went in and to me it was like fame. There was kids kicking their heights and... <laughs> And, you know, do I, I was blown away. So I said to my boyfriend, what goes on in here? And it was actually a sign-up about auditions oh. for the course. So I auditioned. I was told to come in on whatever morning and I had to do two two pieces, a, a Shakespeare piece and an, another piece. It's so embarrassing when I think of it now. No. So I, I stole from the school library because I went down to visit my boyfriend who was still at school, Claire Bloom doing Juliet, the tapes. And I came home and I basically copied Claire Bloom. And then I thought, I've got to do another one. And he said, well, what about this play? And it was um, Juno and the Peacock. I love that play. But I never read the whole play, Julie. I just looked through it till I saw Mr. a woman's Jean name. Fitz. Bessie Burgess was her name. And I thought, I'll do her. Never read the play. Never read any of the plays. Went in, auditioned. Couldn't believe it, what it was like, these people sitting at a desk in front of you and go up the back and do it. and Terrifying. Went for it, came out, and it was the days when they said, we pin your name up at lunchtime. So my boyfriend and I went out for a fag. And I came out and I said, they pin your name up, apparently. Oh. So I went, my name was pinned up. And then you went back in in the afternoon if your name was pinned. And then it was all about be a tree and be this. And I was rubbish. 
And was I, that working with people in a group? Yeah. Like improvising? And I had and... no idea what they were talking about. Okay. You know, I just basically was pushing my way forward, probably trying to be, just look at me, and it wasn't <laughs> happening. So I didn't, but then they wrote me a letter saying I was on a waiting list. So I almost got in, which was a miracle. But anyway, that and that's went, before the band. That was before the band. But all well, the music's still there. This is at the very beginning of me being in Glasgow. So if you got in, you would have went I to... I would have gone the, to the drama. It's called oh, the Royal Conservatory. Yeah, I would have. The, you would I, have been I there would doing have. the acting I course. I would have, yeah. Lurie. I would have. But I didn't get in. But anyway, then the band split up. I had two kids. We're talking about 1994. We were actually in Los Angeles. Ricky was recording a solo album there, so we were spending the summer there, and I was just enjoying looking after my kids and not working. And a friend of ours who's called Paul Laverty, who actually writes with Ken Loach or for Ken Loach movies now, I think he's done the past five or six, at the time was over there researching a, a film, and we got in touch and said, look, come on up to ours, see somebody Scottish, somebody normal for a wee while. So Paul came up and we had a great night with him. And it was Paul who said to me, do you ever think about acting? And I said, no, it's too late now, I'm 34, blah, no. blah, blah. Anyway, that was all that happened. And then I came home and one day Paul phoned me about six months later and said, look, I'd really like to come out for dinner with Ken Loach. Ken's in town, I'd like to come out for dinner. So we went out for dinner and I had been a huge Ken Loach fan and I thought, I have to do this. So I went out and Ken Loach has the most amazing ability. Not that it's that hard with me to just make you talk about yourself. Aww. And he just and just kind of sat there and listened and so this and this and this and tell me about this. And that was it. And then got And did asked, you just click with him? Could you feel quite yeah, relaxed? Yeah, I felt good with him. But I had to audition. Then he said, I'd like to come in and audition for this film I'm making called My Name is Joe with Peter Mullen. Oh. And we had to go in and do improvs, which I'd never known anything about. I just found all that absolutely fascinating. And there was a wee bit of me that thought, well, you've asked me to do this. I've not put myself forward, so if I'm rubbish, I'm rubbish. That's so you. Do you know what I mean? I was Bloody like, right, go for it. But it was so funny, you'll know all about this. All these different actors that you're doing all these situations with, just invent a scenario and they all burst into tears in about five seconds. That seemed to be the thing to do to get attention, to burst into tears, and I couldn't do it. I was like, oh, she's crying. It'll look really stupid if I'm crying too. And do did you, know you cry? Mean? No, didn't. Good, because there was too many of them crying. They're all anyway, crying. Anyway, that's probably why you got it, because maybe. you're probably really natural, and he's going, so why are they I can crying? see them all crying. <laughs> So anyway, I got a, a small a part in My Name is Joe and uh, it was a brilliant experience and a real eye-opener. And then I thought, that's it, I can act. But Lorraine, that's a big movie. Like, that's a real iconic movie. It, Obviously, at the time when you're making it, you don't know that, but oh, did you thrill. just throw yourself into just it? Just threw myself into it and loved the whole experience and you'd literally get the, the, the scene for the next day put through your door at night because he didn't want you no rehearsing. Script. No It was a very vague, you know, bare bones of a script. Didn't want you rehearsing the scene. And it was just such a buzz, so exciting and... Peter Mullen was in it, it was fantastic, and Louise was in it, and it was just Gary Lewis, and it was great. But I came away from it under the impression that I could act, and then got my next job, which was in Taggart, and realised I couldn't act. Oh, we, because... Who were you in Taggart? Uh, I was a waitress, I think I was the... Mur I've been in Taggart three times. I think I was the murderer Oh, the best one. folk have. But I remember, I thought, oh, this is brilliant, I can do this, and I had to do a conversation while filling salt cellars because I was a waitress. And then I remember the continuity women coming up and saying to me, hope you remember exactly where every one of these salt cellars was filled up to what oh. point in the car. And I went, what? <laughs> what did you Because you had to do it again, yeah. of course, oh, different for take. retakes and, and eye lines. And but your... you're saying that made you feel, like, were you, did you feel you were rotten? Oh, or... I thought, I can't do this. I thought it was just going and be totally natural. Because his style his is, style they was don't care just about that. Yeah. Nobody in the room, and I'll never forget the first time <laughs> rehearsing for Taggart, and they went, can we get the crew in, please? And about 40 people walked in. <laughs> Terrifying. Like, oh, my God. All no, watching you. It was a real bump of reality, and I thought, and now, even though I do think in some ways acting is something you can do or you can't do, I realise now when I work with people like yourselves and like this recent play I've just done, young people that have all been through 
drama school there's a lot to learn but hold on a minute it's not like the acting thing didn't work out for you because then of course you got cast as one of the original cast members in River City yes well six weeks not quite the original they were six weeks in when I joined but yeah that was a that was a that was a brilliant they mustn't have seen the tagger (laughs) they couldn't have seen it I deleted that one (laughs) no I remember reading about the soap Scotland soap coming to Glasgow and all that and just thinking oh that would be brilliant to be involved in that and it was really hard to get in I think I auditioned for the part of Alice four times and it was really hard and for those listening Alice it was Alice Henderson Alice Henderson and can you tell us a wee bit about her she was a complicated character (laughs) funnily enough she had been she had had a really hard time with her her parents in the show Uh, and she had she had been an alcoholic she'd gone off to London and she'd been on all the drugs and all that and the London so it's it's full on heavy full on heavy stuff and again I was there for four years and that was like going to drama school for me there's no better way of learning I would imagine I know you're saying and a lot of people talk about that that go into acting and I always go I don't don't get me wrong I love being at drama Mm -hmm. school but it's not the be all and end all as in somebody like you they've got all that massive life experience you're on that Set, you know that you're reading that script that's learning on the job and also as well it people is. especially younger ones are going to doing telly first rather than mm-hmm, theatre mm-hmm. which is really scary oh yeah you just have to sit and watch and learn and I always say just be quiet you on do. the set and watch them and they'll say things like how do I know where the mark is but you'll have been just absorbing all that yeah, and too. watching it and, and it's a really brilliant place to learn because you're in every day you know and you get a chance to right to be really exposed to it all and I got to see some great people acting and be beside them and I remember my first one of my first scenes and I had to be really sad in it and the, uh, the director wanted me to cry and I couldn't could you not no, I couldn't I remember you thinking, didn't feel it oh my god I'm so busy thinking about this and and I hadn't got to that point. I can now tap into things when I need to. I've seen you do you know, that. Yes. N- night after night and men should weep or whatever. But then I just couldn't do it. And was it because at that point, maybe you couldn't forget about the camera being yeah. there and stuff like yeah. that? Maybe it was like... Self-conscious and mm-hmm. and intimidated and, and, and worried about how you looked and all these things. Because you're so... I can imagine you being able to access being vulnerable, easy peasy now, I know, because I've seen you doing it, but... I think that's amazing to even be admitting that because, because that's just experience and letting yourself yeah, go. But absolutely. also that's about being around the right people at that's the right so time. True. That's when so you're true. with the right actor and, and you just look... And my favourite thing is when you lose yourself in it and you oh, actually forget, yeah. which sounds a bit pretentious, but you, you do. You forget As you're actually know, yeah, doing it. They're do. the joys. Mm-hmm. But I can imagine you, any time you've ever talked... I've, I've never been in a soap or lucky enough to be in a soap, but when you've ever talked about it, the carrying on that you've had as well oh, and the friendships and but there's a real and and our lovely our lovely producer Tony was in it with you. I can hear him laughing in my ear. Um but to have that work, I know because I've got, got friends that are mm-hmm. still in it now, they work you guys really hard. They Anyone do. that's listened to this that thinks that River City's not hard, it's, it's a, hard. Bloody hard but graft. Do you know what I would like to say about acting for me? Acting for me introduced me to actors who I honestly think are some of the best people I've ever known in my life. Oh, Best friends I've ever made. I mean, I've got friends from, obviously, great friends from before acting, but I didn't think it was possible in my 40s and 50s to meet people in a job and think, I want to be your pal for life. Oh. Because you go into an acting job, it's where we met. Yes. And you meet people and you've got whatever, three months, six months, three weeks together. You have to make it work. So actors are really given people. They they want to make you feel good. They want to they want to be your friend. And in the band, it was a really lonely existence. I mean my husband was in the band. That was brilliant. I had no girlfriends in the band. My yeah. girlfriends were all from before that. So I made some of my best friends, as you know, in the acting world and I will for ever be grateful for that because I missed out on that. I've got so much to be grateful to acting for because I met the best people. As an older woman, mm-hmm. and I'm including that myself, I'm 49, mm-hmm. and you are 50. 57. And by the way, she doesn't look that. But we're talking about this, so. well, if you don't mind me just rounding mm-hmm. up with this, because of the nature of the podcast being Inspiring Women, mm-hmm. we do have to shout louder, don't we? So oh, now yeah. as actresses, I know yeah. you've just ju- done the comedy of errors mm-hmm. with um, The Citizens, mm-hmm. which you really enjoyed. Mm-hmm. And you said to me, I was asking you about it um, off air, and you said, Jules, I loved it because I'm 57. I've mm-hmm. never done Shakespeare before. I've never done Shakespeare. And I thought, if I don't 
do this and I was scared to say yes to it but I, I really wanted to do it. it was with Dominic Hill who's a brilliant director and when the sits who had a fantastic company and I thought I really want to do this but I was terrified and I'm 57 no training I've never done Shakespeare and I was playing five characters oh. and I won't lie after the first week I was crying in the car park thinking oh. I can't do this can't do this and I could see these young actors and I could see how much their training had helped them. And I really noticed what I lack. But it was doable, you know, and I got there and uh, they helped me and the director helped me and it was great fun. And th there's a thing about, I mean, we've spoken about this before, about stage fright and about nerves. I don't suffer from stage fright, but I'm so nervous about getting stage fright that I kind of got myself into this state. This is going to happen. What? Cause one night you're just going to wake up and you're not going to be able to do it. And I just thought, no, you're going to have to park that idea. Nothing's that important, you know. If if it all goes wrong, it goes wrong. You'll survive. Yes. You know, even if you get the worst reviews in the world and you never work again, you'll survive. But you're totally right. And sitting here, and I've learnt things today I didn't know about you before, but the thing that's just reinstated for me is, is Lorraine McIntosh a survivor? And the answer is, yeah. Yes, well, you are, that's Lorraine. that's nice to know. That's but, nice to but know. But you are, and if somebody's listening to this day that didn't know anything about you, that's what comes across, oh, Lorraine, well, and that's... you're survivor. Can I just ask you one tiny last question before we go? So with all these things that you've achieved in, in your, your personal life and your career, mm -hmm. is there something that you want to do that you've not done yet? Well, that's interesting. Is there something left? Well, it's, it, it kind of feels like, you know, like you would say, Ricky and I haven't really in the past 30 years worked a day in our life because we've enjoyed it. But that's not quite true because it is hard work. And but Deacon Blue did our first gig in 18 months last weekend at a festival down in Somerset. And we were so excited about it. Ricky actually said, God, it feels like Christmas Eve the oh. night before. He was so excited because there have been points during this 18 months when we've all thought, is any of this going to come back? It's been a time in our lives that I never thought I'd live through. I mean, I'm sure we all feel like that. Has this really happened? Yeah. And when you look back at, you weren't allowed to have your children over, you weren't allowed to hug your children, it's hard to contemplate that that happened. But anyway, the gig happened and we were so excited and we flew down on Saturday morning, we flew to London, drove to Somerset, did the gig, flew back from London the next day and we came back and we were exhausted and you think you forget it's hard work because it's all the bits round about it it's the travelling and it was the you know the getting up and the getting on a plane again and, and it is exhausting as you get older but we've had a, a fantastic time of doing it and we things come along and you think yeah I want to do that like I'm doing a, a thing that I've never done before for Children's BBC next week that I've never done and I just want to do it because it's a lovely part and it seems like a lovely wee programme and I think there's not, it's only a week's filming, I can do that of course so wee can. things come along and if you want to do them and you're in a lucky enough position to say yes then that's all I want to do I'm just thinking about you. I'm seeing this 11... I'd love to have been pals with them, but this wee 11... <laughs> we would have been separated at school. The wee 11-year-old Lorraine, if you could go back and talk to her, mm -hmm. what would you say to her? Oh, I would say to give her... Give her a cuddle. I'd give her a cuddle and I'd say, I'm sorry that this has all happened to you. You're doing great. Um, and it'll get better. That's all I could say because... I, I don't think I could do anything else. I'd just, I'd actually say, I think you're doing really well and you'll get, things will get better. You know, hang in there and you don't need to be ashamed about anything. No. <laughs> That's gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, the two actresses sit here are <laughs> crying now. But the way you told it there, like, you know, I mean, you still have that about you, that youth about you, but to know that, that's all anyone needs to hear. That imagine mm -hmm. went back and went, by the way, you're going to sign a record deal and you're going to be in this band and you're going to do all these amazing things. You're like, just to go, listen, it's going to get better mm -hmm. and hang in there and to have that hope. It's all happened for a reason. I believe in all that. Oh, I've been well, reading an awful be lot of stuff in lockdown time and it's like you, you get back what you put out there and you've done that for us. You, you have done that. You've totally done that. You're an absolute superstar, but I don't think we could define you as in and she was. 
That's the great thing about you, Lorraine. And she was gallus, sassy, funny, bossy boots. We'll have bossy boots. <laughs> Talented, a riot, emotional, brave. You're all of these things. Oh, and thank, thank you God so for you. Much. And I'm just so lucky to be your pal. Oh, Love me you. too. Thank you, Lorraine. Thank you, thank you. Always good to end on a wee greet. <laughs> I think I can honestly say that that is one of the most fulfilling conversations I have had in a long time. For an inspirational woman, look no further than singer, actor and all-round good soul, Lorraine McIntosh. My grateful thanks to Lorraine for joining me on this podcast and thanks to you all for listening. You can find future episodes on Acast, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. With thanks to Matt Ramsey for editing and mixing this episode. This podcast was produced by Solace Sounds. Solace Sounds.